الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودع لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وهل أتاك نبأ الخصم إذ تصور المحراب إذ دخلوا على داود ففزع منهم قالوا لا تخف خصمان بغى بعضنا على بعض فاحكم بيننا بالحق ولا تشتط واهدنا إلى سواء الصراط إن هذا أخي له تسع وتسعون نعجة ولي نعجة واحدة فقال أكفلنيها وعزني في الخطاب رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين uh, Today's khutbah is actually about a really peculiar, very interesting story in the Quran It's only mentioned this one time This is in Surah Sad, the 38th Surah of the Quran And it involves a prophet of Allah named Dawud alayhi salam And Dawud alayhi salam is one of the rare prophets in the Quran You know that most prophets in the Quran um, had to face a lot of opposition and they were not in a position of power. So the people that didn't believe in them were always in a position of wealth, power, and status, and the prophets were struggling against them. But few exceptions exist to that norm. Uh, the eventuality of Yusuf alayhi salam is in, in the ministry position, Sulaiman alayhi salam, and in fact uh, Dawud alayhi salam uh, are in a position of power. And Allah <laughs> describes how much power and authority he had given them. Um, in that position of power, Allah Azza wa Jal describes this one incident that occurred in his life. This is, you can, to set the stage for what's happening, he is the ruler, he has a palace or a castle, and part of that palace is his inner quarters. If you imagine the old days in palaces of kings, the king's quarters are not easily accessible, they're up on top of a tower, they're guarded, right? This is a, it's a chamber that's, that's uh, very difficult to, to get to for obvious security reasons, and then whatever they want to have any private conversations or whatever, these are chambers that aren't accessible to everybody else. Uh, and this is, of course, also a place for him to pray. So it's his private prayer chambers, his private musalla that's there. Now, what Allah describes here is, وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ نَبَأُ الْخَصْمِ إِذْ تَصَوَّرُ الْمِحْرَابِ Did the news of the arguing groups uh, khasm in Arabic can be used for one person, it can be used for an entire group. Okay, so uh, the tasawwaru, the plural form here, describes that there was a group of people that were having an argument that scaled the giant wall. Did you get the news of those who scaled the giant wall? If tasawwaru al mihrab, the praying quarters. So the scene set here is Dawud alayhi salam is alone in his prayer area, or he walks in. And he sees people that have come from the outside, not from the security gates. They've come from the outside. They've climbed the walls of the palace somehow, come in from the window, and they are in his private quarters. 
Now, from the, from the grammar of the language, it's not clear how many they are. You could say khasmani means two, but then after that, the sawwaru, the plural, is also being used. At the very least, there are two people, or there are more than two, and they represent two sides. So there's one person with many and one person with a few, or there's many on one side or one on the other, or there's one and one. We don't, that's not entirely clear. But there are some indications that they, in, at least from a Balaghi point of view, that they seem like more than two or there's an overwhelming number, and that's captured inside the, 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 the fi'l tasawwaru. So this is a pretty scary situation, right? You're, nowadays, obviously we don't live in palaces, but if you're ever in a hotel or something, and you check into your room on the 40th floor, and as you're walking in, some guy's breaking in from the window and saying, hey, I got a question for you. I've seen your videos on YouTube. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a pretty scary situation. You know, it's a pretty psychotic too. These people are, clearly are normal, and they're just jumping in at me. So it's actually a very terrifying situation. Plus for kings, the only time somebody would walk into your quarters like that is to assassinate you. That's the only reason they would come the other route. We also know about Dawud alayhi salam that he's a man of justice. And he has, because he's the ruler, he's also the judge. You know, back in the day, people used to bring their cases, their pleas, their requests to the court of the king. And he just hears their pleas one by one and he passes the case or gives somebody money or helps somebody out or resolves a conflict and the next one and the next one and the next one like the town hall hearings right so he has a process for that already so why are these people taking this strange route to come and jump into his his praying quarters if dakhalu ala dauda when they came and they just sprung up on daud alayhi salam fa fazi'a minhum so he was shaken up because of them so he was terrified because of them now, faz'ah is one of the Arabic words for fear, and it has a, an interesting connotation. The kind of fear that makes you not think straight. So for a moment, you get rattled, and you can't think very clearly. Now, there are different elements of fear. There are times, for some people, when they are in a clutch or fear situation, their, their senses get heightened, and they're able to make better decisions in that moment, right? And others, in some other situations, you're caught in a situation off guard and you're not normally, you're not processing things in the normal way that you would, right? So he's in this situation where he thinks he doesn't know what their intention is and he's a little bit terrified of what they're doing here. So they respond, قَالُوا لَا تَخَفْ Don't be scared. لَا تَخَفْ خَصْمَانِ بَعْضُنَا عَلَى بَعْضُ We are two people that have a conflict. Now khasmani could again mean one person, two people have an argument with each other. Or it could mean two groups that are, have a conflict with each other. And there are a bunch of people on this side, a bunch of people on that side. Okay? And this is also kind of making sense from the language qalu. It's not qala, it's qalu. It's the plural is being used. So there's an overwhelming number. Plus Dawud alayhi salam is known to be a warrior. He can handle two people. But this seems to be a more overwhelming number. Right? So one of them, you know, they speak and they say, uh, we're two groups that are having an internal dispute. Some of us are having a dis disagreement with the other. فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَنَا بِالْحَقِّ Make a judgment between us, uh, you know, justly, بِالْحَقِّ uh, وَلَا تُشْتِطْ uh, You know, أَشَطَّ يُشِطُّ إِشْطَاطًا This is an interesting verb in Arabic. It actually means مُجَاوَزَةُ الْحَدْ وَالْقَدْرِ الْمُتَعَارَفِ Like, when you go past the limit and you, you break the law in some way. So don't use your position of power to be biased against one of us and not the other. Obviously, you know, the background is also that kings normally favor the wealthy, right? Because the wealthy help keep their kingdom going. Like nowadays, okay, we don't have, you know, in the West at least, we don't have kingdoms that much. But the idea that politicians like the people that donate to their campaigns. So if one of them and their business is in trouble, like if there's an oil lobby or a gun lobby or a whatever lobby that's making lots of money and is supporting a particular political party or a candidate, then when they have an issue, the, you know, the president's going to listen a little more carefully, right? Because they supported his campaign. So there's always a relationship in history between money and power, right? So people with money try to influence those that have power. And people in power can only stay in power if they stay good with the people that have the money. The treasury is kind of how you hold the government together. So the threat that's been given to him now in his own quarters, this is again not the courtroom. This is his personal space. But they're saying, make fair judgment between us. Don't be unfair. Don't cross any lines. And guide us to the straight path. Guide us to 
you know, we'll, we'll listen to your verdict. We trust your verdict, and that's why we're here. So this is already a pretty strange, shocking kind of situation. And you would expect Dawud alayhi salam's immediate response to be, security, get these people out of here. I'll hear their case in the courtroom. I'll deal with that later. But Dawud alayhi salam decides to in, in, instead deal with their case immediately. Now it's, it's important to wonder why would someone do that? Why wouldn't he just say, hey, this is not the time. This is not the way. You need to take the proper channels. Do this appropriately. This is no way to get justice by busting into my, my private quarters. My family could have been here. Anyth anybody could have been here. He could have any number of justifiable reasons to not hear anything they have to say. But he's engaging them in conversation anyway. The question then begs itself, why is he doing that? Why is he, why is he talking to them to begin with? He doesn't owe them this conversation. And he doesn't know that these are, we're gonna, I'm going to break the surprise for those of you who haven't heard this story before, these were all um, angels sent by Allah Azza wa Jalla as a test. This was actually not real people, this was actually, and they, once this test was over, they disappeared, and he realized he was just being tested. So this was actually a, a, you know, a, a case study, an exercise, a drill that he was being put through. But he doesn't know that yet. So he allows them to engage in this inquiry on their terms. Now, this is the first problem that I want to put before you. Any, any, any uh, uh, one of us can face any kind of injustice. And actually, what we're going to see here is, إِنَّ هَذَا أَخِي When they start describing their case, إِنَّ هَذَا أَخِي لَهُ تِسْعُونَ وَتِسْعُونَ نَعْجَ وَلِي نَعْجَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ One of them says, this right here, this is actually my brother. This, seriously, I have a fight with him, but actually this is my brother. And he owns 99, uh, 99 sheep, and I only have one sheep. Right? So he's already starting to describe the, the, the problem, right? Now, this doesn't seem like a war situation. This is about sheep, right? And they are, able, they are willing to scale the, the walls of a palace, risking execution to solve a sheep problem, right? They would be the ones that get zabiha if they, you know, because of what they're doing. They're risking their life to do that. In that is also a kind of lesson. Sometimes a problem isn't very big. It's actually not very big. It can be resolved with conversation, it can be resolved with some mediation, something like that. But you know what? People can take a small problem, and if enough of them get heated up enough about it, they can actually make it into a very large, serious problem. And they're willing to take steps that normal human beings would never take, escalating something. So the first lesson to, to you and me is that we're going to face situations in life which can be resolved easily. It's just sheep. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. It's not that costly. And it's, it's, it's not that big of a problem. But you will always have a choice. You can take this issue and resolve it calmly, gently. Somebody has to back down. Or you can let the conflict escalate. In conversation sometimes, somebody says something you don't want to hear. You say, what did you just say? Wait, say that again. And then they say it again. Oh, that's it. And now it's escalating, right? Now you could find a way to stand your ground, hold your self-respect, and yet not escalate the situation. And then when you take it to your cousin, your uncle, hey, by the way, they said this. The uncle also has a choice to make the situation much worse. Oh yeah? Oh, you, you're going to let that go? You're just going to listen to that and not respond? Or the uncle can say, listen, they're going through something, they're, they have their own issues, this kind of thing happens, why are you making this a big deal? Let's go solve it. Right? You, every time, to every person that this, this is communicated with, they can either escalate or de-escalate. Right? But this is clearly escalated to a point where they're willing to risk their lives and come all the way up. And if they're this crazy, perhaps even if they, if they hear a judgment that they don't want to hear, then they could do other crazy things. If, they, if they've gone this far, right? So what we're, what we're learning about is a story where people are seeking justice. But they are willing to do a lot of injustice in the name of seeking justice. I'll say that again. There are people that are apparently seeking justice, but may be willing to engage in all manner of injustice to pursue that justice. Breaking into somebody's home, whether they're the king or not isn't even the point, is a terrible injustice. And your conflict does not justify you doing this. You understand? So Allah is teaching us a reality. People in their mind are doing the right thing. 
But even if you're doing the right, if you feel you have the right to engage in this fight, to engage in this conflict, you don't get to cross other limits set by Allah to do it. But Dawood salam from his point of view says, sees that there are people that need help, I'm going to overlook their violation against me. They've crossed the line with me too, they invaded my space. I won't hold them to account for that, let me just help them. Because he's in a position to get them all killed actually. That's a, that's a crime punishable by death. There are snipers on top of the White House, you know that, right? And in any other governmental building. So this is enough for them to be executed. But he has, he's been given power, but he's also been given rahmah. He has the power to annihilate them. But instead, he's just going to deal with their problem. Shaken up as he is. So he decides to talk to them. But before he talks to them, the, there are one, there's one brother who owns 99 sheep. The other brother owns just one sheep. The guy who's talking right now is the owner of one sheep. So the wealthy one is not speaking right now, it's the poor one, the victim, that's speaking. And what does he say? He says, قَالَ فَقَالَ أَكْفِلْنِيهَا So he said, my brother said, just let me complete, you know, give me the custodi custodianship, give me ownership of that one sheep. I got 99 already, I'll just take care of the hundredth one. What are you going to do with one sheep? Just give it to me. And I don't want to give it to him. So he basically starts being rough with me and says, وَعَزَّنِي فِي الْخِطَابِ He talks to me in a, in a harsh way. When he addresses me, he addresses me harshly. I can imagine if I'm going to see this from the 99 sheep owner's point of view, what are you doing with one sheep? Let me just pay you money, just give it to me, I'll take care of it. You don't know what you're doing with one sheep. You know? And he's like, oh, you're, you're so mean to me. You try, you're trying to take my one sheep even after you have 99. He's got his point of view. From his point of view, I'm doing my brother a favor. This sheep's going to die, you're not going to get anything out of it. Just, why don't you just take some money for it? The other one, no, no, no. He's just trying to oppress me. He has so much and he's got his eye on my one sheep. Right? What we're learning again is there can be multiple points of view. And we're learning the, the supposed victim's point of view who says, my brother's oppressing me because he wants to take over the one sheep that I have. Or maybe he doesn't even want to pay me, he just wants to take it. He just wants to take it from me because he's so, so you know, powerful and wealthy. Right? وَعَزَّنِي فِي الْقِطَى now the next ayah is about the response of Dawud He hears this case, but there's already a big problem. The pro I, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to understand the problem. When a judge hears a case, right, there's the plaintiff, and there's, you know, there, there's two sides. There's also the defense, right? There's people that are, if there's two people that have a dispute, they both have to be heard from. They both have to present their case. They both have to say, hey, okay, he spoke his version, now let me tell you my version of events. Or let me tell you what's, what he didn't tell you. Because if somebody wants to come to you and say, uh, they have this problem, this wrong thing was done to them. Let me tell you, 99% of the time, I'll use the 99 from this ayah. 99% of the time, you know what they'll tell you? All the things that make their case look good. And they won't tell you all the parts that make their case look bad. Right? If, you're, if two brothers at home, two siblings at home had a fight, Ahmad punched me. You know, he hit me. Okay, Ahmad, told you not to hit your sister. You could, you could go that route. Or you could say, what did you do? Nothing. What if, I've never done anything. Ahmad comes, you know, she kicked me like 10 times before I punched her. And now there's, there was more to the story. But if you just hear Ahmad punched me, then Ahmad's going to get, you know, sentenced. And, and Mariam's going to be like, <laughs> got you again. Because dad doesn't want to hear your version. He doesn't believe you. Right? So you could just, you could pre be predisposed to hearing someone and saying, how can they be lying? Look at the poor guy. He's just got one sheep. You know, miskeen. And if I say to the owner of 99 sheep, hey, why don't you tell me your side of the story? It might seem like, look, I'm the king. I want to hear the millionaire's side. The 99 sheep owner side, man, these kings, they always want to favor the business people. They always want to favor the wealthy, right? So now there's a PR problem too, possibly, right? Because if you listen to the wealthy, then you're like, but I told you I have the problem. Why are you listening to his side, right? The thing is, when, and you've experienced this at home if you have children, if there's a conflict among your kids and you listen to one kid's version of events, They'll, you'll never be able to hear their events without the other child saying, no, no, that's not what happened. No, that's not what happened. And they, they, they butt in the middle. They're lying. You're lying. And you have to say, no, let them finish. Let them finish. And they finish. 
and then you try to tell your version, and before you, they even tell, you, you cut to the second child, no, you don't even want to hear what I have to say, you, only, you already believe him. So what happens? People that are so passionate about getting their justice, means what, winning their case, they then accuse the judge of being unfair, right? And they all, oh, you always favor this one, you always favor that one. They are predisposed, you know, uh, assumptions that someone is always going to favor X, Y, or Z. Just like in a family, it happens in the courtroom, happens here, happens there. You know, and any time you're in a position of judgment, you will make assumptions based on your previous experience. Man, I know all these like, all these, you know, father-in-laws, they're all the same. All these daughter-in-laws are all the same. All these, you know, these men are all the same. All these kinds of women, they're all the same. I've seen like four of them before. That means I can speak on behalf of 400 million more of them because I've seen four examples already. You know what we do? You experience one or two cases, and now you know that all of humanity works this way. You figured it all out, right? There's an assumption. Assumptions are really dangerous, but they make the world easier to understand. Because you've seen one or two cases, that must mean everybody's like that, right? And then it's not, it's hard, uh, it's, it's much more convenient to see the world from the assumptions point of view and not see every case as unique and individual. It's just easier that way, right? In an, in an environment where somebody will cry out against someone and victim, you know, like blame them as the, the perpetrator, like you know, there are sometimes viral videos and things like that where they show, show one person oppressing another, right? Somebody's beating somebody up, somebody's humiliating somebody, some, some context, right? And everybody's like, oh, this person's a racist, or this person's oppressive, or this person's abusing their power, or whatever. There's all kinds of stories like that. Could it be that there's more to that story? Even if there's a thousand times that this kind of thing happens, could it be the thousand and first time it's actually something else that's going on? Is that possible? And if somebody even raises that voice, all of a sudden they become a racist or a supporter of the oppressor or you know, the, 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 a shamer of the victim, etc., etc. You understand? Now, what does Dawud do? He says, قَالَ لَقَدْ ظَلَمَكَ بِسُؤَالِ نَعْجَتِكَ إِلَى نِعَاجِهِ He has done wrong to you by asking you for your one sheep and having it join his 99. He's done wrong to you. And then he adds, وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ And there are lots and lots of business partners, people that are mixed in family, people that have joint property, people that have joint businesses, people that have joint work, people like that, that whose lives are intertwined. Khulata, people whose lives are intertwined with each other. A lot of times people that have lives intertwined with each other, then some of them start crossing the lines against the others. They start, in, you know, like for example, if a parent passes away, then the inheritance is not distributed fairly among the siblings, for example. Property disputes happen, right? Or for example, when people started a business together, and then later on, one of them is not putting the work in or investment in, but they still want more of the income, and then they fall, things fall apart, right? So people that are intertwined, a lot of times when it comes to money and assets, لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِّلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except for those who truly believe and do good deeds. So what is Allah telling us? We think, believe and do good deeds means you believe in Allah, you, you do dhikr, you remember Him, you, you seek His forgiveness, you pray your five prayers, you fast in Ramadan, you go to Hajj, and now Allah is telling us when you do those things and you're still, you know, uh, uh, scamming your partner in the business, when you're still lying about your taxes and you're still, you know, uh, jipping your sister for her share in the inheritance, then you can go to all the hajjas you want. You don't count as far as Allah is concerned among الَّذِينَ amanu wa amilu salihat. Because if people have iman and good deeds, then they don't act like that when it comes to money and business. Because that's all, you know, that, then all of that's just a show. But it's not really iman and amal saliha. So he says, وَقَلِيلٌ مَا هُمْ And how few those people actually are. People that truly believe, truly do good deeds, and then they, they, you know, they don't wrong each other. It's interesting that Dawud I told you is in a position of power, right? You know what that means? That people under him are all Muslim. He was a prophet of the Israelites, who were the Muslims of the time. So he is the Khalifa of a Muslim Ummah at the time. So the majority of people living under his rule are actually believers. So it's strange words coming out of him saying, except for those who believe and do good deeds and how few they are. In fact, he's ruling in a place where they are the 
majority, but he's not talking about the official label of being Muslim, or the appearance of being Muslim, or the attendance in the masajid. He's not talking about that. He's talking about people who actually live by iman and good deeds. And as a result of that, they don't wrong each other. They don't exert their influence against each other. And he's, this observation is absolutely true. وَقَلِيلُ مَّهُمْ And how few they are. وَظَنَّ دَاوُدُ أَنَّ مَا فَتَنَّاهُ Listen to these words. And Dawud Alisam realized immediately that we were testing him. He, it dawned on him. After he passed this judgment, what was his judgment? The wealthy one has done wrong. And this happens a lot of times. People that have more influence, when they're intertwined with those that are weaker, the weak oppress the poor. It happens all the time. That's what he says. So when he, real, when he passed this judgment, the moment this judgment came out of him, he realized that wasn't what I was supposed to do. Even though many of the things he said are true. You know, إِنَّ الْخُلَطَاءِ إِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضِ is true. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ is true. وَقَلِيلٌ مَا هُمْ is true. But he realized just because that happens all the time, you cannot use what happens all the time and bring that into your thought process when you're judging this case. You have to leave that aside. You have to leave that, this is a new case. I've given you this example before, if you have a divorce court, right? And the judge is a man, and the, he himself went to, through a divorce, and the wife took everything. He's kind of mad, but he's a judge. And then in front of him, there's another case. And there's a woman who's about to take everything from her husband. He doesn't see a new case. He sees his own case, and he sees a cartoon version of his wife's face in front of the the, the woman's, and he's, his judgment can get influenced because he's really upset about what happened already. You understand? He's bringing his experience into judgment. He's bringing his other observations into the judgment. And Dawud salam, as a ruler, has seen this all the time. Obviously, he's not speaking in just thin air. He's a ruler. He's seen corruption in his society. He's seen the powerful oppress the weak. That's what he's been fighting his whole career. So when this case comes in front of him, he's remembering all the other hundreds of cases where he's had to deal with this exact same situation. So based on that knowledge, he makes this comment. But interestingly, these comments are missing two things. One, it's missing the testimony of the guy against whom there is a claim. The 99 sheep owner never said a word. That's the first thing missing. And if you want to have a fair trial, you got to hear from all sides. You gotta let somebody defend themselves. They have a right to a defense. They have a right to a context. Could it be that these allegations are false? It's possible. Could it be that there's more to the story that was conveniently omitted by the one sheep owner to make his story look more believable, make himself appear as more of a victim? Is it possible? Absolutely. He's not being accused. But you know what, we've turned that into, oh, you don't believe the victim? No, I don't believe they're, I can't believe they're, if I believe they're a victim, I've already judged the case. If you say you don't believe the victim, uh, until we can prove that there's a victim, calling them the victim is already a problem, you understand? So Because we, we judged before the case even began. And now, in our climate, there's already outside pressure to judge the case the way the social media wants to be to judge the case. The judge the case the way the outcry wants to judge the case. The protesters outside want the case judged a certain way, right? Based on what they may have heard or seen. And so it could be politically very difficult for anyone to make judgment about any case being blind to what's going on outside. And it could be because of that pressure. In Dawud Ali Sam's case, it's because he's dealt with a hundred cases. He dealt with a thousand cases, but he realized this was a test. This was a test. So two things that were missing. You didn't hear from both sides, and you made assumptions about other cases, and you brought that thought process into this case. If you're going to judge anyone, anyone, about any situation, then you cannot bring your past experience, your hundreds of times you've seen this before, oh, I hear this all the time, oh, here we go again, no, there's no here we go again. Every story, every case, every conflict is unique. And everyone has a right to be heard and understood. If you, you and I truly understood that, you would, you would see the internet differently. You would see most of the conversations you're having at home with family members differently. 
you would see your opinions of so many people differently. Because so much of that is informed by our experiences with others and our assumptions imposed on them. What does he say? People, people wrong each other. You know, th those who don't believe and uh, those who believe and do good deeds don't do so. But then he, at the end, he says, رَبَّهُ So he sought the forgiveness of his Rabb. Dawud alayhi salam seeks forgiveness of his Rabb. What's he asking forgiveness for? What has he done in the ayat except speak something that's true? The only thing that's wrong here that he realizes he should have done is that he should have turned back, he should have understood both sides, he should have investigated further. Just because he says, I have one sheep, he had 99, just, to, just to, because he says, he has, I have a brother. None of that stuff adds up yet. There's actually even a third problem. This wasn't happening in the courtroom. Where was this happening? This was happening in the mihrab. There's a time and place and process for justice, isn't it? There's a time and a place and a process. If you break that time and place and process, what was the first problem? When they came into the room, didn't he get shocked? Didn't he get shaken up? A judge needs to be in a position where he is, any emotion cannot alter his thinking. When he's already shaken up, he already, you know, he's not on solid, stable footing. But in his courtroom, when he's mentally prepared, when he understand, when he there's there's a process in place, this is the right place and time to do it. So justice isn't just about getting one's verdict. Justice is about these three things: the right process, time and place. It's about having both sides heard clearly, and it's about the judgment being free of other cases and other assumptions. When those three things are in place, then judgment is happening and even the best judges can sometimes forget that when they're in the heat of the moment. So even Dawud salam forgot it momentarily and what did he do as a result? He made istighfar to his Rabb and he fell into sajda. A couple of ayat later as I end this, I share with you, Ya Dawudu inna ja'alna ka khalifatan fil ardi fahkum bayna nasi bil haqq wa la tattabi'i al hawa fayudillaka an sabilillah. I'll share this ayah with you and we'll conclude today. Dawud, we have no doubt made you someone left behind with responsibility in the land. So judge between people using justice and truth. And don't follow emotions, don't follow empty emotions, al-hawa, whims. فَيُضِلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Then they will mislead you away from Allah's path. Did Dawud follow any desires? No, hawa here is not his desires. Hawa here is his own bias from previous experience. That's also hawa. And Allah is telling him, don't use hawa as a judge. Because if you do, it will take you away from Allah's path. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَضِلُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And no doubt about it, those who, who stray away from Allah's path, لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ بِمَا نَسُوا They have severe punishment, intense punishment, because of what they forgot. Because of them forgetting. And what did they forget? Yawmul Hisab, the day on which exact accounting will happen. Allah has described Judgment Day to us many, many times. What has He told us about Judgment Day? Is somebody else's opinion of you going to count on Judgment Day? No, only the facts will. Everything that will be held against you has proper witnesses and evidence. And nobody else's case is being looked at in comparison to yours. Oh, this one's just like that one. Put them in this category. Everyone's being judged. Kulluhum atihi yawmul qiyamati farda. They're coming as an individual. Allah has set a precedent, even in describing Judgment Day, He's actually given us a glimpse of what judgment should look like in this life. How should you judge any individual? Within the limits Allah has given you, you should not, you and I should not be, you know, making any, any bit of assumptions. Oh, all these people are the same. All the people that do this have done it for the same exact reason. The same crime can be done for a hundred different reasons. The same crime could be done for tons of reasons. You know, I, I, just think, think about that today. Just process this today as I leave you. If you testify against someone falsely, okay, in court, in court, you testify against someone falsely and you accuse them of stealing. And because of your testimony, they get arrested. Right? That's a pretty bad thing, I would imagine. But Yusuf salam testifies or creates a testimony against his brother and gets him arrested and it withheld, doesn't he? It's the same, if you just heard, oh my God, somebody falsely testified. What a horrible thing. That's evil. Islam is again, really? There's a context. There's parts you don't know. 
It's, it's remarkable that in that story, and that's, if you just heard about, oh, false testimony or false imprisonment, then you would say this is evil and this is bad. But what did Allah add there? فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ In that same context, Allah says, above everybody who knows, there's somebody who knows more. It's the all-knowing. It's not just about ulama. This ayah is actually about, you can't know all the, the dynamics of a case before you pass judgment. So I pray that we take this warning seriously. If Dawud is being given the warning, you better not become biased in your judgment because those who do have forgotten the day of Hisab and they can have severe punishment. I don't want you to be from those kinds of people. Then this definitely applies to us. And we, I pray that we don't fall trap into the kind of wave kind of thinking and this group kind of thinking and the cultish kind of thinking that has now become commonplace. You belong either in this group or that group. And you have a position, and that's it. Now, now your judgment about everybody is the same. Everybody who belongs to that group is all the same. There's no, there, there's no nuance. There's no, you know, complication. It's easy judgment, right? You can be can have little information and have big judgments. And the way of this deen about other people is, even if you have a lot of information, you're still scared to pass judgment, because there might be something you don't know yet. There may be more benefit of the doubt to give. So I pray Allah instills this in all of us and saves us from the fitna that arises as a result of not being aware of these realities. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al-Nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر الله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتاً